against the backdrop of the sun. Um, more than 60 years ago, Sheldon Glashow, one of the fathers of the standard model of particle physics, um, he wrote this paper while he was a postdoc at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen, Denmark. And this paper basically points out this process that you must have read about in the news. It's, known, it's now known as the Glashow resonance. It's the on-shell production of a W boson um, in, um, uh, well, the on the, it is the on-shell production of a W boson so, and the resulting enhancement in cross-section. At the time he wrote this paper, they did not know what the mass of the W was. So he, he wrote down the incident neutrino energy required to trigger this, this resonant uh, on-shell production, assuming the mass of this boson to be roughly the mass of a nucleon, so the mass of a proton, I guess. And so it was about 0 0.9 TeV. And uh, subsequently, thanks to collider physics uh, experiments on Earth, we have, mod we have measured the mass of this boson. Um, the other thing is that there was a change in notation in historically. At that point, they called it the Z minus for some reason. And now, we, now that we understand electroweak unification better, we call it W minus. And thanks to experimental physics um, prog uh, progress in the last uh, 60 years, we now know that the mass of this object is more than uh, 80 times uh, what uh, Glashow assumed it to be, which uh, then taking care of all the frames means that we expect this resonant enhancement at an energy almost 10,000 times as high. And the question is, how do you get um, particles of that high energy? And the answer is nature gives us that. I'll tell you about that, but uh, so so you must have come across this uh, discovery, uh, well, not the, uh, not a discovery, uh, this announcement by Ice Cube um, of a particle compatible with the Glashow resonance. That is this this process that was predicted more than sixty years ago. We believe we saw this in on eighth December two thousand sixteen. Um, at, at the time of this event happening, I was a postdoc at what eventually, uh, you know, what the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen eventually became, which is the Niels Bohr Institute. They renamed it um, after, um, after the death of Niels Bohr. And so while I was a postdoc there on the 8th of December 2016, we saw an event that we believe is, is the glass of resonance. But to really tell you about all of that event, I have to tell you about much of the progress we have made with Ice Cube over the last decade or so. So Ice Cube is, uh, to those who are not familiar with it, it's a very cool thing. It's a, it's a block, one cubic kilometer of ice at the South Pole that we have instrumented with photomultiplier tubes. A photomultiplier tube that you see here is a device that will, uh, if you put a large voltage across it, it will give you small bits of current in response to photons going in. So it's a, it's a way of measuring light. We have put that inside uh, pressure vessels made of glass and we have put in 5,160 of them deep inside the ice between 1.4 and 2.8 kilometers deep in the ice at the South Pole. Um, and we have a detector made of that. So we each of these DOMs, um, uh, these pressure vessels are called digital optical modules, DOMs. Uh, they, they are along strings or they, they are put along cables, which are called strings. And we have 86 such cables in the ice. And on each of those cables, we have 60 of these DOMs. And uh, the typical separation between the cables is about 125 meters. On a cable, the typical separation between the DOMs is about 17 meters. In the middle of the detector, we have a region where we have put the cables closer together. So something like 70 meters uh, and the DOMs on the cable are also closer together, about seven meters. Then the photomultiplier tubes on those DOMs at the center uh, have a higher quantum efficiency and we call this denser infill array at the center, um, uh, the deep core. And uh, the reason we have done all of this is to try and detect something known as Cherenkov radiation, which is the light emitted by particles when, uh, when uh, they travel through 
any transparent medium or well through any medium but you can see those lights on uh, those photons only if the medium is transparent um, with a velocity higher than the group velocity of light uh, in that medium so because uh, you know the, the velocity of uh, light is lower in any medium than it is in vacuum um, the light will be traveling with a slightly lower velocity than c in uh, in ice but uh, high energy charge particles which are relativistic will nevertheless travel faster than that so then you get an effect similar to a so sonic boom wherein a lot of uh, light is emitted according to something known as the fran fram formula and we read that light out using these uh, photomultiplier tubes um, and the signals are uh, you know they are digitized on board the doms but they are read out and stored to disk on the counting lab on the surface, which is the picture I showed you uh, on the first slide. And um, so apart from the main ice cube array and also the deep core denser array at the center, on the surface we have something known as ice top, which is basically these domes, but inside water tanks. And they can sample uh, the you know, ch charged particles produced in particles interacting in the upper atmosphere, which I'll tell you about later. So you can think of this ice top as, a, as an air shower array, sort of similar to the Graves 3 array that uh, Sunil Gupta and uh, Prabhat Mohanty have uh, built and their, co their colleagues have built uh, in Uti. And so Ice Cube has an air shower array on top, it has an inice array, and then it has an infill array uh, with denser instrumentation. The main uh, detector can can see neutrinos with roughly energies above 100 GeV. And, it, and it's this, due to the more denser part at the center, it can see neutrinos with energies roughly about 10 GeV or so. To, to appreciate just how huge this is, you can see a two scale representation of the Eiffel Tower. So the detector in its uh, uh, you know, uh, height is more than three times as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Uh, but thankfully we get all the ice for free, so it's not too expensive expensive to build it was like 360 million dollars so this is a picture of uh, looking into a hole that was drilled in the ice as a cable with doms on it is being lowered into it just to get an idea if you fly into the fly onto the south pole you will see the amundsen scott geographic south pole station it's a research station of the united states and then ice cube is about 2.6 or so kilometers away, the counting lab. And this is the outline of the detector that it is usually not visible from the surface. Not usually, it is never visible from the surface. So the ice cube collaboration today consists of uh, um, many institutes from various countries. Roughly half those institutes are in the US and Canada, and the remaining half are in Europe, uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. If all goes well in a couple of years, we'll be seeing India also as a light blue picture on this map because our TIFR has applied to join IceCube. The process is underway and we'll have an IceCube group here. So that's something I'm looking forward to. In this talk, I will talk about um, you know, our understanding of uh, neutrinos at high energies uh, which come from outer space uh, and the study of it known as neutrino astronomy and astrophysics so I'll, we'll talk about so also talking we'll look about we'll talk about looking for their sources um, then we'll talk about neutrino physics which is new you know the things that ice cube has done neutrino nucleon cross-section measurements neutrino oscillations and then the glass of resonance which we spoke about ice cube also does a whole bunch of other things um, there is cosmic ray physics with ice top there is solar physics we look for uh, supersymmetry, strangelets, pride in production, magnetic monopoles, um, and such exotic particles. We actually study the ice because understanding the optical properties of the ice is, um, is the single most important thing for us to operate our detector. And uh, so, uh, as a consequence, we have, we, even though we are physicists, we have become experts in, not we as in me, but some members of the collaboration have become experts in glaciology and we have written a few glaciology papers. And then uh, we look for dark matter with ice cube. Um, I will not be speaking about any of these topics in this, in this talk. In this talk, I will talk about uh, uh, neutrino astrophysics and the glass of So 
the thing i want you to understand about neutrino astronomy is that it is it is one of the most recent messengers in our quest to understand the universe through most of human history um till you know till uh, till just 100 years ago we have seen the entire universe only in this narrow spectrum and only using photons and that too till maybe 700 years ago we had to do it with our naked eyes um in so in the last um, you know 600 700 years we have started using telescopes to look in these uh, within the spectrum but very recently in the last 100 years or so we have also started building telescopes that look outside this range and so in the radio we have seen things like the jets coming out of huge black holes at the centers of galaxies um we have seen remnant radiation from the early universe um but as you go to higher energies x ray and gamma ray we have seen non thermal processes which complement our knowledge of high energy physics and um, almost on the same time frame about um, maybe let's say 100 years ago victor hess uh, is credit credited with it but uh, it's a sequence of uh, events around the world also discovered charged particles coming in from outer space known as cosmic rays and we and you must have all have heard of this uh, in the last 10 years or so we have seen gravitational waves coming from outer space we have measured them well we believe we have measured them and also neutrinos thanks to ice cube and uh, neutrinos are unique messengers because for example the measurements of cosmic rays over the last uh, 100 years or so tells us that uh, we have charged particles coming in from outer space to and interacting with the earth's atmosphere which span about uh, 12 orders of magnitude in energies um but the unfortunate thing is that because they are charged unlike light they the, the direction of their arrival do not really you know preserve the information about where they came from so you have to probe for them indirectly which is uh, based on based on energetics and our understanding of uh, the different objects that make up the universe we believe the few things that can accelerate particles to these energies are things such as supernovae that is stars exploding at the end of their life and also black holes at the centers of galaxies uh, converting accretion power gravitational energy into into uh, non thermal uh, part uh, you know emission in the form of jets etc but these are all hypotheses to 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 really confirm that they are actually producing cosmic rays you have to see some signatures of it you can probe for it using gamma rays because wherever there are cosmic rays uh, the protons will interact with other protons then they will produce pions which will decay to gamma rays but gamma rays can also come from things like inverse constant scattering uh, or synchrotron radiation so we don't know for sure that uh, seeing gamma rays means there are protons or hadrons being accelerated there but if we see neutrinos coming from any source that would be like a smoking gun signature for cosmic ray uh, acceleration because we know that uh, electromagnetic showers uh, produce much fewer uh, let's say uh, muons and neutrinos than um, hadronic showers so uh, neutrinos are unique messengers in the sense that uh, they will allow us to probe these processes they are also um, unique in the sense that the they are the messengers the universe is the most transparent to so in in observable light we see most of the universe but uh, if you go to higher energies where we want to see non thermal processes the universe is actually quite opaque to most of the photons for example um, at pev energies due to pair production with uh, photon background so ex- extra galactic background light um, and also things like the cosmic microwave background the mean free path of a photon in the universe is something like roughly 10 kiloparsec so it is the distance from us to the center of our own galaxy so if you want to see processes at pv you cannot see that with photons uh, beyond our own galaxy because the universe is opaque and the cosmic rays that i mentioned at the highest of energies because they have uh, extremely high rigidity they this deflection even though they're deflected by extra galactic um, uh, uh, by interstellar magnetic fields it could be of the order of 1 or 2 degrees but even then they don't travel too far because they will uh, 
go through some process known as the Grais and Zatsis bin Kuzmin um, process, which is the, uh, the resonant production of a delta plus uh, particle. This is at an energy of something like 57 eta electron volts or so. So the, at the energies where cosmic rays may point back to their sources, we again see them only out to maybe a few billion light years around us, which is really the local universe because the Hubble horizon is more than a hundred times that size. So, so all of these messengers suffer from these limitations, but neutrinos do not because neutrinos do not carry electric charge. So they're not deflected by magnetic fields. They travel straight. They interact only weakly, which means that they, they will literally go through anything. So, uh, you know, it's like uh, Saruman said about the eye of Sauron. It's gaze, ice cubes gaze as a result will penetrate through the entire Earth. So ice cube sees roughly about 3,500 events every second, which then translates to about 70 billion year, uh, events every year. But the vast majority of those events are actually muons produced directly when protons in, uh, or charged particles interact with the upper atmosphere. So these muons will traverse, will go through the atmosphere, they'll go through the ice, and then they'll enter the, uh, the instrumented region of the detector. And uh, so in, the, in, the, in what we call the downgoing direction, when you're sitting at the South Pole, but in this orientation, it is the upgoing direction, which is the view of the southern sky, you see about six orders of magnitude higher backgrounds than um, in the, when you look at the northern sky, which is when you're sitting at the South Pole, the upgoing direction. So in the upgoing direction, you see only interactions of neutrinos near the detector, uh, in or near the detector. Uh, that is roughly about 80,000 per year from neutrinos, neutrinos produced in these same interactions. And then there are the neutrinos that we consider signal, which are not produced in these interactions, but which are neutrinos coming from outer space. And those we, have, we see roughly about 10 per year. So you can imagine what a statistical challenge this is. And we see basically two types of events in ice cube. We see one which, uh, so here the colors correspond to within a readout window, how early or how late uh, the, the photomultiplied tube saw photons. So red star stands for early hits and blue stands for late hits. And so you can see that this forms a clear track-like signature within the detector. And this is because of a muon going through the detector. The other topology that we see is a huge shower, uh, which is due to a, either a hadronic or an electromagnetic shower developing within the detector. The advantage of the muon topology is that um, if it is and due to, if this muon is due to a neutrino interacting um, to produce a muon, then um, the kinematic angle is rather small. It's, it's of the order, it's less than 0 0.1 degree or so at uh, energies uh, uh, relevant uh, at uh, TeV energies. And then we have the ability to reconstruct this direction to a precision of about 0 0.6 degrees or so. So this is really the workhorse of neutrino astronomy. The other advantage is even though we have only about one kilometer cube of instrumented volume, we don't need this interaction to actually take place within the detector. It can have ta taken place outside uh, as long as the muon makes it to the detector. So we have uh, effectively tens of kilometer cubes of uh, effective volume for this topology. Um, but but if, the if the interaction takes place outside the detector, we have only a lower limit on the energy. So it's not really a good channel for calorimetry. On the other hand, for this uh, sort of topologies we see in the detector, which comes from, uh, let's say, all other, um, all other uh, flavors of neutrinos, electron and, and uh, new E and new tau interactions, as well as what is called neutral current interactions of, uh, of e even muon neutrinos. Uh, the advantage is that we can actually reconstruct the energy very well to, a, uh, to an accuracy of about 30 or 30% or so. But the angular reconstruction can be done only above 50 TV and that too with a current precision of something like 15 degrees. Um, when we first built the detector, we had we did not believe we could really reconstruct it, reconstruct these things to 15 degrees. It was more like 60 degrees. All the improvement is because of the studies of the eye's optical properties. In both these cases, unlike um, 
uh, let's say a detector such as um, the India-based Neutrino Observatory, which has a magnetized uh, ion calorimeter, uh, we cannot really tell the charge of the, we cannot tell muon, mu plus and mu minus apart. And consequently, you cannot tell neutrinos and anti-neutrinos apart, except for the case of this glass show resonance event, which actually changes this. So I'll be coming towards that in the end. So once again, just to explain the two, two topologies, we see tracks and that's from a, from a charge current interaction of a, of a muon neutrino, then which then kicks out a muon as the uh, lepton. Um, if the other two, if it is the other two flavors, then uh, because uh, tau will quickly decay, mostly hadronically, then there'll be a shower. Um, or um, uh, uh, let's say the uh, electron will quickly lose energy due to bremsch lung and form an electromagnetic shower. Or if it's a neutral current interaction, there are again just showers within the detector. So these are the optical properties of the ice. As you go from, let's say, this is where the top of the detector is. This is where the bottom of the detector is. As you can see, both the absorption and scattering lengths at the bottom of the detector are about a factor of four larger or larger than at the top of the detector, which means the ice gets better at higher pressures and higher uh, um, as you go deeper uh, into the ice. Um, in the middle, right in the middle of this detector, you see this small, this region that corresponds to much worse optical properties where the scattering and absorption lengths fall to like 20 meters or so. And this, this region or uh, less than five meters in the ca case of scattering. This is a dust layer that we have within the detector. Um, it's not 100% sure where we get the dust layer from, but between 60 and 100,000 years ago, there was a period of enhanced volcanic activity um, on earth, which led to let's, uh, rapid cooling and uh, freezing of the ice, etc. And at that point, we believe uh, a lot of volcanic dust was dumped into the water, which then refroze. So in the middle of the detector, we have a layer of ice that has terrible optical properties, which is known as the ice layer. And uh, I believe this, uh, this period of enhanced uh, volcanic activity more between 60 and 100,000 years ago is also associated with uh, what is known as the Toba catastrophe event and uh, maybe even a pot population bottleneck. It is believed that a, a vast amount of human beings, vast majority of human beings alive during those times died out. And at some point, the human population around the world came down to about 10,000 10, or so uh, maximum. So that is an imprint we have in the middle of the detector. So in 2013, we announced this discovery, which is that we saw neutrinos coming from outer space. Uh, sorry, Tamil. Uh, very naive question. How does this affect in your uh, shape of a particular event? Uh, you mean the 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 dust layer? Uh, yes, I mean the difference optical properties at at different height. Um, if you have a charge track going through, I mean, can you? How, I mean, how does I mean, visually? Do you have any um, any way to say how does it matter when it? Uh, how does it look? Well, uh, because uh, of the variation. It, it makes our detector completely non-homogeneous, which means that um, we, we currently have an ice. So, you know, when you see a figure of merit of ice cubes, such as an effective area or, or an exposure, they're all volume average quantities. Um, our microscopic description of the detector takes into account uh, the complex ice models, which uh, take into account all of these variations that you see. Uh, but the, the, at the end of the day, the answer to your question is that the bottom of our detector is much more, uh, let's say, has a lower trigger threshold, lower energy threshold, has better angular resolution, et cetera, than the top of our detector. So when you publish a photo of a charge track inside the detector, let's say coming from top to bottom, does that already um, unfold it? Meaning that uh, is the efficiency factor, or, because it's continuously varying. So is it already taken into account or, I mean, is this the corrected picture or this is actually what you see? Th this picture is, uh, uh, is in terms of number of photo electrons. So it is the charge. So it is not corrected for, uh, uh, for this ice property. Okay, I see. But we do account for these things within our reconstructions. 
because the reconstructions involve an ice model and everything. If you want, I can send you specifics of the papers related to that towards the end. Oh, that would be nice. Thanks. Yeah. So um, in 2013, we announced that we discovered this. It was, uh, it was on the cover of science and it was even also, I think, a discovery of the decade. Um, what we saw is that uh, in a specific sample of events that we isolated for uh, particular properties, um, we expected only a background of about 12 events uh, with, uh, with an uncertainty, but we actually saw 54 events. And if we made a distribution of the total charge detected uh, deposited within the detector, um, uh, the, the expectations from all our understandings of atmospheric uh, neutrino production was at the level of, um, uh, of this, uh, but our events were far more. So 54 in, uh, instead of the 12 expected. And so this constitutes a greater than six sigma. Well, the initial publication was not 54 events, but uh, it slowly built up and this constitutes a greater than six sigma rejection of the atmospheric only origin. How we did this analysis is that to get rid of these atmospheric muons, we defined a veto layer of, uh, of the detector. That is, we decided that the outermost layer of the detector is um, a, a veto layer. So if within our trigger window, um, the outermost layer of the detector sees any charge, we throw away the trigger, we throw away that event. This effectively selects for events which, in which the interaction vertex was within the detector. We also, even then, um, we still had a lot of uh, background because some of these muons uh, can cheat, uh, you know, can leak through the outermost layer. So we also looked only at extremely high energy. So we threw out the vast majority of the events we see. Um, and uh, by applying a cut at 3,500 photoelectrons uh, of charge deposited within the detector. And so what we eventually saw was this sample of uh, 54 events, which then uh, if you estimate how much of that should be background, et cetera, you just cannot make it work using atmospheric neutrinos. So it has to be an extra, uh, uh, an astrophysical component. Um, we looked at the directions of these events, but the vast majority of them were the not tracks, but cascades of the type I mentioned earlier, which means that we don't see any obvious clustering. You might think this means there is a source here, but it is, you have to think about it statistically. If you ask the question, how often can you get this by random chance? It is quite often. And consequently, we don't have a detection of, of, uh, you know, uh, of, a, of a source from just clustering analysis and this kind. And just to understand how hard it was, or, or well, it wasn't, it is not very hard that, thanks to the tools we have today, but just to appreciate the statistical challenge of uh, identifying these events, uh, like I said, we see about 70 billion events per year, and these are at the level of, let's say, 10 per year. And uh, so this is the amount of charge that is de uh, deposited within the veto region. This is the amount of charge that is deposited in the detector as a whole. We have a charge cut, which rejects all the events on this side. And then we have a charge cut also in the veto region, and that gives you the signal event. So even though we initially saw this astrophysical flux only within our contained sample, subsequently we have seen it. Ramis, could you go back? Maybe? Yeah. This overflow is uh, happening. Uh, that is uh, which way I'm which one Oh, that is uh, um, too much charge in the veto region. They are all. And that arises due to? No, that's just due to let's say it's a it's an open wind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you. Uh, you can have lots of charge deposited within the veto region. We reject all of those events and we didn't want to show up. This is just a bin accounting for all events. Yeah, we do that. I was wondering what is the source of those. Okay. Very high energy events that start outside the detail. Yeah. So in, in this analysis, we are looking for only very high energy events that start within the detector, but you can still have very high energy events that start outside the detector, which we have to reject. Mm -hmm. And that is, they're all in the overflow bit. Okay, thanks. Just a uh, visualization. Uh, Ravi, so, yeah. Ravi, just to understand this again. So uh, uh, when you say selected events, uh, uh, 
uh, in the plot that you're showing out right now. So of course there is a lower bound on uh, charge associated. And yes. uh, what is this? Is there some other bound also on the charge in the Veto region? Yes. So when we say if, if an event has uh, any hits within the Veto region, we throw away that event because we know then it started outside the detector, which means it is most probably a muon. <laughs> Uh, when we say that it is based on, uh, let us say, the total charge has to be less than three because you can get three from just uh, dark count or, uh, you know, uh, from noise. Mm -hmm. So the total charge within the veto region has to be less than three, but the charge within the fiducial region has to be more than 3,500. But uh, uh, follow-up question, I would expect that uh, for such events, uh, you actually would have many events which have a large amount of charge in the veto region, no? Yes. So large amount of charge associated with the event and large amount of charge in the veto region. So why is this blank white space uh, uh, that is sort of on top of this red line, there's a blank white space. Why is that? You mean this? Yeah, yeah, yeah this space. Yeah, so this white space is along this axis, no? So uh, the highest is, I mean, here what you're seeing is really the neutrino spectrum this speed steep falling off uh -huh. you we are statistics limited at this point this is this would be the total charge deposited within the detector by like a pv event and we don't have much events beyond pv so this okay. this region is empty okay fine so, thanks thanks yeah and I understood this cool thanks sorry is there sorry is there a lim size limitation on the veto region for why you can only detect smaller number of charges uh, because you know it only goes to 250 no that's that's what i think uh, was the asking, veto no? region charge well it, yeah, it goes yeah. beyond we just haven't shown it here it's all in the overflow bin ah, As okay, you see I the see. overflow bin is much higher okay okay uh so you know the signal of interest here is on the upper end of this charge and is on the lower end of this charge because the it, that's literally how veto works which is why we wanted to focus when we made this plot on this region. And then, so then you don't want a large dynamic range. So we made an overflow bit. Maybe I can ask for this image to be, re I mean, I can try and remake this with, uh, let's say better binning choices, since it seems to be causing confusion. But um, uh, we have uh, on top of this channel on a completely non-overlapping sample of through going events. So no veto, only upgoing events. Again, uh, analyzing uh, eight years of data, we have seen uh, um, more than six sigma evidence separately of astrophysical neutrinos. So this is just uh, reconstructed neutrino energy and the flux. And as you can see, the this is this is without any uh, veto. It is upgoing events, track-like events, and you can see a clear excess here that cannot be attributed to back. So we have also compared the astrophysical flux that we are fitting in all of these different uh, channels. So this is the contained cascade channel. This is the upgoing tracks. This is the non-contained cascade channel where we again have some, uh, you know, so, uh, less than five sigma detections. And uh, they're all, so this is the level of the flux and this is the spectral index. The spectral index shows us how fast the, the spectrum is falling off. And they are more or less consistent. There are some mild tensions, but uh, they are at the le level of two sigma or so. And the, so all these channels tell us that the astrophysical flux has a spectrum somewhere between E raised to minus two and E raised to minus 2.8. So roughly comparable to what we see in cosmic rays. And then it has, a, has a, the number, of, the total number of neutrinos we see is the differential fluxes at this level. We have also, by looking at the ratio of tracks to cascades, etc., we have an idea of their flavor ratio. We don't, we cannot tell all the flavors apart perfectly because, like I said, uh, ch charge current uh, tau and charge current electron uh, interactions are, are not really distinguishable. Uh, charge current electron interactions are not really distinguishable from neutral current interactions, etc. So this can be done only statistically. But even then, we can uh, come to some conclusions, assuming our understanding of oscillation parameters, etc. That is, uh, uh, the sources that are emitting these neutrinos cannot be producing purely electron neutrinos from neutron decay, because that would lead to a different flavor ratio at Earth. 
um, and uh, source these sources cannot be you know muon damped in the sense uh, uh, that uh, the muons lose energy at uh, source due to synchrotron radiation which would lead to uh, at source flux rate uh, flavor ratio like this so uh, the these contours are very large and they're statistically not conclusive but they give us some hints about the properties of the sources that produce these neutrinos so one of the things to do once we have found a flux is to now try and find the sources and the most straightforward way to do so is to just take all the tracks and look for clusters right so we isolated a sample which has which is not based on uh, based on uh, uh, vetoes etc through going tracks and we looked for statistically significant clustering of high energy events using likelihood based analysis the idea of this is to look for this kind of signal that is buried here. We have discovered the signal here, which is a diffuse flux, but we are looking for the sources of this, which is so to find the signal buried there using a sample, which has roughly the, this is the energy response as a function of uh, the declination, which is um, which part of the sky you're seeing. So the Northern sky, which is a source of outgoing neutrinos, you are uh, sensitive to neutrinos in the, let's say the uh, 10 TeV to, 1 PeV range or so, um, because uh, beyond a PeV, the Earth becomes opaque. The neutrino cross section is so high that uh, it will interact, uh, and the Earth becomes opaque. And in the downgoing region, where the Earth is not really blocking it out, you can see too much higher energy. Sorry, uh, is there a question? Amol, was there a question? No, sorry, sorry. Right. Um, uh, actually, I do have a question. It's it's regarding this couple of slides back. It went too fast for me. Uh, so it's pretty nice. No, next one. Um, for clustering pieces, uh, where you are showing how you are deciding where it comes from, could you explain that a bit? If I see a large some amount of number of tracks, uh, how what are you clustering to get the directionality? The directions. So. Because the Earth is rotating and cosmic ray flux is more or less uh, isotropic, uh, neutrinos produced from atmospheric, um, you know, atmospheric neutrinos produced from interactions of cosmic rays with our upper atmosphere will have somewhat an isotropic distribution. It will not be isotropic. Uh, it will be uniform at least within a declination band because our detector response is more or less uniform within that band. But if there is a source producing astrophysical neutrinos, that will not be uniform. That will be, you know, this is this is basically also how our eye resolves a, a source from from the background. Our brain does this processing. We look for an excess uh, above an expected background, right? And that that excess is really clustering in direction. So the right. Sorry, uh, th this is so the clustering. What you were saying is the clustering in the sky. Yes, it's, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. I, see, okay, I understand now. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So by looking for that uh, such clustering in a sample of events uh, using a likelihood based technique, which takes into account both their directions and, uh, and energies, um, we can look for sources, but so far we have not, uh, far, we have some hints now, but they're not published. So I'm not allowed to talk about it, but the last time we published such an analysis, we still not, uh, we still did not have any, um, any promising sources. But those of you who know statistics will be like, oh, but that's a very small p-value. Obviously, you have a source there. But the issue is that uh, we have to do this at each point in the sky on a very small grid. So we have literally looked everywhere in the sky. And this is the smallest p-value we see in the sky. We have to correct for trials, uh, which is the fact that we look, look, looked everywhere in the sky. And once you do that, the post-trial p-value is, is pretty large. It's close to 50%. So no statistically significant excess and we saw no sources. We looked in the direction of known sources, which are supernova remnants. So there is this idea going back to Fritz Zwicky in uh, 1920s or so that exploding stars is where most of the cosmic rays are accelerated based on purely energetic considerations. And so supernova remnants, which is these things that are left behind after a star has exploded, which, uh, you know, uh, they are expected to actually be great neutrino sources. There are some theoretical com computations that predict flux of the shape. But unfortunately, we looked in these specific directions and we did not see compatible excesses. So now we have upper limits. So we have started excluding some of the more optimistic models, but uh, 
basically what this means is that we need much more data or a bigger detector to be able to resolve and see these kind of sources as a neutrino telescope. We have looked for oh, it. One more naive question. So uh, why do you need clustering? Why don't you just pixel it? Why don't, oh, so uh, we can also just create pixels in the sky and that would be a binned analysis. Um, uh, we, we can, um, but we, we studied the ability, uh, you know, we studied the sensitivity of these sort of uh, analyses. And uh, for example, based on the, based on the kind of, um, uh, track that an event leaves within the detector, uh, you know, uh, how good a track it is, etc. We can also associate with the event. Uh, there is an event by event angular resolution, like with one with for one event, you can say, oh, the angles are, we have reconstructed this to 0 0.3 degree precision, maybe with another event, you can say it only to two degree precision. And such information to take into account, it's better to use an unbent likelihood. So we did uh, multiple studies, we found that unbinned likelihoods are better than binned likelihoods. A, a pixel that, a pixeling the sky is basically a binned likelihood analysis, if you think of it statistically. Uh, and we found that unbinned analysis are much better. Also, because uh, we have energy proxies for these events and that information cannot be used if we just use sky pixels, right? They will need, also need to have bins in energy. And then, uh, uh, so an unbinned analysis is a limiting case of a binned analysis for infinite bits. And there are uh, mathematical statistics proves that uh, uh, in general, you can have better sensitivity from unbinned analysis. So that, that, that's the only reason. Uh, in principle, what you're saying is makes sense. Uh, in principle, this is like making a pixel. So it's a, a, a pixel sky, sky map and looking for excesses. Um, you can think of it that way, but we're just doing a, much, a more sophisticated analysis because it's more sensitive to the kind of signals we think of. So from, from Fermi's analysis of the galactic plane, we now know that there is clear evidence of pi on decay, et cetera. And there is a template produced by Fermi for that. We can use this template and do a likelihood analysis to see if there is a diffuse galactic component. But again, most realistic um, models predict a flux of neutrinos that is much less than our our uh, uh, our current sensitivity, and as a result, we have not seen any excess. So we again have upper limits. The upper limits are above the realistic models, as you can see. So we have not excluded any model. We have looked for a specific kind of sources such as blazars, and we have come up with a statement such as the thousand brightest Fermi blazers do not contribute more than 27% of the total measured diffuse flux. But as I, I'll point out to you later, and we have published this, and this is, this is to the extent of how we understand this analysis, it is a robust statement. But as I will point out to you later, one of our first sources we have noticed is actually a blazer. So some of us are wondering how this has come about statistically. Um, and, and I'll get to that. But before that, we also looked for, you know, correlations with um, ultra high energy cosmic ray arrival directions. So over the last 20 years, uh, observatories such as the Pierre Auger Observatory and Telescope Array have seen of the order of, let's say 400 uh, cosmic rays, which have energies about 57 EEV. And these are the energies at which based on our understanding of like, extra galactic magnetic fields, um, which uh, we can measure using, let's say the Faraday rotation. Um, so the plane of polarization of light and radio waves will rotate as it travels through magnetic fields. So you can compare how that varies with frequency for known sources and measure extra galactic magnetic fields. So we believe that at energies about 50 EV, the deflection should be of the order of a few degrees. And uh, uh, so if maybe we would have seen a cluster if there was a nearby source of neutrinos, but we saw no correlation in these sort of analysis either. And in some sense, that is also not surprising because like I said, this delta plus process um, uh, means that uh, the mean free path of high energy, of, uh, of ultra high energy cosmic rays is of the order of a few billion light years, whereas the neutrino horizon is really the Hubble horizon. You can see the entire, uh, entire universe using neutrinos. So all the neutrinos that we have seen trace out the larger universe, whereas all the cosmic rays that we see 
uh, trace out only the very nearby universe. So the correlation between them is expected to be at the level of less than 5%. So this is not surprising at all. We have looked uh, to see if these neutrinos we see are compatible with neutrinos just produced in these uh, Grisons at suspin kuzmin process, which are known as cos cosmogenic neutrinos, but they have a different flux shape uh, as given by these models based on theoretical computations. And um, uh, we do not believe the neutrinos we see are predominantly from these processes. We still believe they are coming from sources, but the rate at which we have excluded this flux favors then at the highest of cosmic ray energies, we fav favor higher, uh, heavier composition. So we, we tend to think that uh, high energy, cos ultra high energy cosmic rays above 57 EeV or so are, uh, uh, people used to think they were protons, but now that is more or less ruled out from a diversity of observations. We have not found correlations with gamma ray bursts. So these were the theoretical predictions based on optimistic models of how many neutrinos gamma ray bursts uh, should produce, but uh, observations over the last uh, uh, 10 years have excluded much lower than that a 99% confidence interval. And as a result, these models are ruled out and we currently do not believe gamma ray bursts are uh, dominant contributors to this flux. So one of the things we started doing um, is that we started sending out alerts. And the reason to do that is we realized many of these sources, many of these uh, neutrinos could be produced in sources that are going through transient phenomena. That is, uh, uh, so it's a flare or something. And the only way to find the source of these neutrinos is to look immediately. Like I said, Ice Cube sees through the earth. Uh, it sees the entire sky all the time. So it is a four pi detector. There are some, that is, that is a very, it is a statement that should be taken with a lot of nuances. But, uh, and there is a lot of energy dependence to our exposure, uh, effective area uh, with respect to direction, et cetera. But moral, Ice Cube more or less sees neutrinos from every direction in the sky. Um, so one of the things we did was we started um, sending out alerts in the form of astronomers telegrams and also something known as gamma ray coordinates networks. These are, uh, you can also now sign up to you'll receive email alerts for, from some of these uh, things such as the astrophysical multi-messenger observatory network. Uh, why can't I scroll back? Okay, yeah. Sorry, so in the beginning, with the, each of these events took like, you know, um, at least eight hours, maybe even a few days to reconstruct. But in order to be able to send alerts out immediately, we had to set up a separate readout pipeline. Um, where these uh, high energy events are reconstructed on priority and we have been able to send out alerts in as little time as let's say 13 seconds within uh, after the detector got triggered. And um, in 2017, something like, I think this was the 13th or the 14th such event we were sending out an alert on. Um, we sent out an alert within a few days multiple people responded saying that they see something in that direction. And um, one of the things was that the direction of the track-like event at 290 TV we saw was found to be spatially coincident with a known uh, high energy um, emitter of gamma rays. Um, then uh, ground-based uh, Cherenko telescopes declared that uh, they had seen uh, um, uh, compatible gamma rays at the same energy. Um, uh, and subsequently a, follow, a frantic follow-up campaign, you know, using more than 25, 30 observatories around the world across the spectra, uh, across wavelengths uh, occurred and we gathered a wealth of information on the source. So the source is, uh, these are the contours uh, produced by the MAGIC and Fermi telescopes, as you can see, because they're uh, gamma ray telescopes, they have much better angular resolution than ice cube. Uh, Ice Cube has localized it only to this much. And this is a source that is, uh, uh, you can spot it easily on the sky using this constellation. Um, at the time of this detection, very little was known about the source, but within a few months, thanks to the frantic follow-up efforts of the community, we got redshift measurements. So we know this is at a redshift of 0 0.3, which means that it's at a very large distance, uh, or, uh, higher than a gigaparsec or so. 
Um, we, and thanks to all of these efforts, we were able to estimate the statistics of how often this could have happened coincidentally. And uh, unfortunately, that's only three sigma. So at the threshold of what we think of as evidence, you know, start, we start getting excited. But one of the things that this enabled was that this allowed us to go back to archival data and look at the source again. And there we again saw another excess. This excess was not associated with any gamma ray source uh, or a gamma ray flare, but we see a neutrino only excess that was again 3.5 sigma. Consequently, we believe that the source is the first source of uh, astrophysical neut neutrinos that uh, we have seen from outside the solar system. You know, the sun is a um, well, uh, we, we also, so this is the first we have resolved at TeV energies. Um, uh, the sun doesn't accelerate up to TeV energies. Um, uh, and this is, this is the first one outside, uh, let's say, outside our local group of galaxies. We have seen some from a supernova that went off in 1987. These were MeV neutrinos, and uh, that was in the Magellanic clouds. So we also look for, because I said in the last uh, decade, we have seen gravitational waves coming from directions in the sky. We have looked for correlations with known gravitational waves, including the case of the, uh, the situation where they found a gravitational wave and gamma rays at the same time from a neutron star, neutron star merger. But Ice Cube does not see anything. What this allows us to do is then uh, set constraints on a lot of uh, nuclear physics processes. So these are all interesting physics we can do. We can ask questions like how many standard candle sources can we see uh, are required to produce this flux since we haven't seen a single source in our point source analyses and the only source we have seen are, uh, um, uh, is through a multi-messenger correlation analysis. And the answer is that uh, our current upper limits cannot really rule out anything but the brightest sources a class of sources in the sky. But later on, once we have Ice Cube Gen 2, we will be able to see maybe probe sources such as low, uh, low luminosity AGN, starburst galaxies, galaxy clusters, etc. So now that you know how much we know about the astrophysical neutrino flux, which you can think of as like a beam at the LHC, let's talk about what neutrino physics we can do from it, which is the, uh, the interesting thing that you must have read about in the, in the news recently. So in, on, um, in 2016, December 8th, we saw an event that we believe is compatible with a W boson being produced within our detector and decaying hadronically. Um, it it uh, deposited about 6.3 beta electron. Uh, if it was a W boson, if it was a glass show resonance event, it would have to be 6.3 beta electron volts. What we have observed is compatible with that. It's 6.05 plus or minus 0.72. Um, how do we know that this, declare, uh, this decayed hadronically? The reason is this, uh, we see events um, within, we see photons within our DOMs that are arriving too early for it to have arrived if these were coming in, uh, if it was from an electromagnetic shower alone. So um, based on the group velocity of photons within light and uh, we know based on electromagnetic shower, uh, we, in these DOMs, based on the reconstructed vertex, we shouldn't have hits, seen hits before this, uh, but we do see hits. So we believe this was a hadronic shower. The hadronic shower had an energy of um, this much uh, deposited within the detector. These are the, if a W was produced within uh, the detector, these are the decay channels we would uh, have. Um, we would have twice as much, um, you know, uh, it would have it would decay into any of the uh, leptonic channels with uh, equal uh, uh, probability due to lepton flavor universality. Though, if you believe the recent uh, LHCb results, maybe this the standard model expectation should be revisited. Um, we have the total hadronic cross section, which is uh, about twice the total leptonic cross section. So, the first four processes you can think of as mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, and then they all add up to give you this, the total cross-section. And so putting all of this into our likelihood description of our detector, this is the posterior probability density of our visible energy. Oh, sorry, Ramesh, uh, the 
I mean, you do see the effect of W, right? I mean, this is, you are seeing a bright Wigner and it shows on both sides of the peak, right? Uh, for, for the W resonance. Uh, I mean, how, how, I mean. What, I mean what, what do you mean by you? It shows on both sides of the peak. I mean, you know, it, it's a quantum mechanical process, right? Once you calculate it, it uh, it's, it's a bright Wigner resonance. So okay, uh, um, as an experimental observation, all we have, all we can say is that we saw this much energy deposited within the detector, and it was probably a hadronic shower. Um, we cannot, we don't, we don't see a bright Wigner. Bright Wigner, etc., are things we are putting into our our analysis. So, so one of the things I want you to understand about this observation is that. We know at more than phi sigma confidence interval due to the energy that this uh, phi sigma statistical significance that this event was uh, astrophysical, but the idea that this event is is a Glashow event is is favored only at about two point three sigma. So there is a hundred is to one. Or no, I, I did sorry I didn't explain my question very. What I meant by that is that um, what is the exact definition? Uh, what do you think is uh, because you know you're supposed to see events which fall on bright Wigner, and you are going to see pick up events one by one, right? Uh, so what? So I'm just trying to understand from that perspective what is your definition of a bright Wigner and how how do you uh, very uh, I mean uh, yeah a bright Wigner is a mathematic the Cauchy distribution that mathematicians talk about uh, which physicists uh, interpret kinematically that is the bright Wigner. Um, so that, that is in this shape, but I want to tell you how we got the shape. This is the, you know, this is our posterior, this is our reconstruction and that reconstruction has already, uh, taken into it, the theoretical expectation that at 6.3 PeV, we have a peak within our cross section. And that is why we, you see this shape. Uh, can I comment something? Yes. Yeah, so the bright Wigner uh, width uh, will be 2 GB, which is uh, beyond the resolution of uh, present measurements, I think. Yeah, exactly. That's what he's trying to say. No, uh, uh, my question was different, no? What I was trying okay, to say, what understand. exactly so, actually, do sorry. we mean by glacial resonance? This is what I, is it, is it meant that when you, um, I mean, what is the definition that when you see events with that, you can postulate that it's coming in the bright Wigner region that you call all those events to be a events with glacial resonance. Is that what the definition is? No, the, so the glacial resonance has a theoretical definition, which is given by the Feynman diagram I showed in the first slide. The glacial resonance uh, has um, uh, empirical interpretation that the neutrino nucleon cross section at 6.3 PeV should have a uh, should have a peak um, in it uh, as resonant enhancement in that cross section. From a point of view of data analysis of this event, the we can only say with the hundred is to one odds that this is a glass Just of one six. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, in the interest of time, maybe uh, let's let. Uh, Ramiz, continue, and then we'll pick this particular question up uh, at the end. Is it okay? Yeah. So it is possible with a probability of 1 in 100 that what we saw was not a glass of resonance event. And you know, 1 in 100 is a big probability for physicists. Uh, we like everything to be 3 or 5 sigma, 5 sigma at least. I mean, usually, right? So there is a 1 in 100 probability that this was just a charge current interaction that happened off resonance. And we really cannot tell this apart. But because you know you don't you don't need to null test this as a detector we don't have the capacity to null test this, so we we, we tested the hybrid hypothesis that this was uh, uh, this is a glass of I mean it it we we put in the standard model and we recover the idea that this was most almost probably a glass of resonance event um, that would be the way I would put it uh, we can discuss this at the end of this talk in more length if required. Um, one of the other things that we have been able to do in the last few years in terms of neutrino um, properties is that because we now understand the density of the earth and its nuclear composition, etc. very well, we, we have an idea of uh, how, how neutrinos, um, you know, how they should get attenuated at different energies as they pass through the, pass through the earth. And we have, uh, we have fluxes of neutrino 
flux measurements for both hemispheres separately. So we can use, uh, we can combine all of that and measure the, uh, uh, let's say, all we have not measured the cross section in a bin by bin way. All we have measured is we have measured if the cross section is greater than or if it is a multiple on standard model predictions. And what we find is that at these energies where uh, compared to let's say low energy uh, HERA measurements, et cetera, we have no empirical input. We finally have some um, experimental input in the sense that uh, we find measurements that are compatible with standard model predictions. This is nevertheless valuable to the community because for example, some of the leptoquark models that could not be excluded at the LHC, et cetera, um, predict a sudden enhancement in the uh, neutrino nucleon cross section at higher energies uh, due to, uh, uh, and uh, the fact that we don't see that, we see something that's compatible with the standard model, then excludes a lot of these leptoquark models. Um, another thing uh, about deep inelastic scattering that is interesting for particle physicists is the Oh, sorry, one more question. Where are you going to talk? Are you going to talk about um, how the analysis of the detection, like the Mion tail and, and how much, uh, what you actually do to separate it out from the background and stuff like that? Um, um, well, I, I, I can talk about it at the end of, the, see this, this event was in, a, it, it was in a partially contained sample. So after our veto, uh, based uh, event selection, we have, um, uh, you know, enhanced our event selection in such a way that um, we, we do the veto, we use the veto layer condition to reject events only if it is in the earlier half of the trigger window. So then you can identify events that start within the detector, but they can go out later. And so then you get an event rate uh, compatible with uh, slightly higher than the earlier contained uh, selection. And that is the selection in which we identified this event. Um, I don't have slides on the event selection related to that. Uh, sorry, but uh, I can, I can, uh, we can take that. We can have yeah, that. Maybe, maybe we could, we could have another general club talk where we could uh, sure. can discuss this a bit more. Sure. So uh, all I want to emphasize about the glass show resonance event is that we saw a partially contained hadronic cascade in the detector with this much detect uh, deposited energy. And the only way you can interpret that, given our understanding of the standard model of particle physics, is that it has a hundred is to one odds of being a glass of resonance on top of being a charge current interaction. Um, there were talks that uh, Ice Cube was not seeing glass of resonance events, and this is indications of some kind of new physics. They were not, you know, our our uh, our absence of finding a glass of resonance event was not statistically significant. So the, those, those were just ill-informed uh, uh, talks within, uh, uh, let's say, outside Ice Cube community. And now, now you can put that all to rest because we have an event compatible with the glass of risk. So um, yeah, that's, that's all I want to say. Uh, another thing that we, like to, we would like to measure is something called the inelasticity, which is within a charge current interaction, how much of the, pre, uh, of the incident neutrino energy is carried uh, by the muon. And uh, this actually, uh, the inelasticity predicted from the standard model is uh, different for neutrinos and antineutrinos at low energies because it's not uh, fully deeply inelastic. Uh, you still see the valence quarks, but as you go at uh, higher energies, um, you see the interaction, the, uh, the pattern distribution functions are dominated by the C quarks. And as a result, uh, the new and new bar uh, 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 inelasticity uh, as well as the cross-section predictions all go to, you know, they become the same uh, at higher energies. Uh, and we measure these and we find things that are completely consistent with standard model predictions. So nothing su surprising in any of these places. Um, one of the other things we can measure is that starting in 2000, um, uh, starting in uh, the late nineties also, we have had this idea that neutrinos oscillate, that is uh, the density matrix, uh, uh, am expressed in terms of uh, flavor and uh, and mass eigen basis are not simultaneously diagonalizable. So if you if you have a neutrino that starts off as an electron neutrino at one point uh, is produced as an electron neutrino, you might measure it later and it might be a muon neutrino, etc. And measuring these oscillation parameters 
is um, one of the um, one of the leading areas in neutrino uh, physics, particle physics research now. Ice Cube is able to do this even though we don't have a beam of our own by let's say using measured cosmic ray flux to predict what that beam would look like, uh, what the neutrino flux we are measuring in a zenith and energy dependent way would look like uh, if the oscillations did not exist. And then you, then you compare against uh, different oscillation models and the contour we get is actually quite uh, compatible with, uh, uh, with the terrestrial experiments which have much better systematic control of the beams. And this is um, quite, um, you know, it's very heartening for us because it means we really are starting to understand all the systematics of the eyes, etc. But as you can see, it's not, uh, it's not as precise as the terrestrial experiments. So this brings us to the to the future. Um, uh, we we have seen only one source, even though we have discovered um, a, a diffuse astrophysical flux of neutrinos, and for the first time in human history, started probing the universe using these uh, fascinating fundamental particles. Um, uh, the the future is, of course, to try and resolve the entire sky. That is, we want a sky map of neutrino sources. The same way now we have a sky map of gamma ray sources and. And uh, we, 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 you know, uh, we have charts of the sky, etc. And to do all of that, uh, you need a much bigger detector. So the plan is to have um, a detector that is spaced out much larger. So you just put the DOMs uh, much further apart on each strings. You have more strings, and you build it outside of Ice Cube. So then Ice Cube will become like an infill array for this future facility known as Gen Two. And uh, um, so then, because the detectors are placed farther apart, the energy threshold is higher. Um, so we will see mostly, uh, we will see 10 times as many events per year as we see now, or that is the hope. And we'll resolve events up to uh, sources that are up to five times fainter as, uh, as we have seen now. Um, one, of the, one of the things about, uh, uh, this detector is that uh, this proposed detector is that because of this, we're just making the detector sparser to make it bigger. It will still uh, be in cost terms comparable to Ice Cube, so it will be costing about four hundred and fifty million dollars. Um, it will have uh, just on top of just the in ice array, we will have a much larger surface array consisting of uh, both uh, both radio and scintillation detectors, etc. So uh, what, what you currently think of as ice top will be made much larger. And this is one of these areas where um, we can actually contribute in India and the TIFR group, because uh, um, uh, I know for a fact that the UT group, um, uh, which does cosmic ray physics uh, at CRL, have the ability to manufacture uh, scintillators and electronics to build a very high quality air shower array at uh, extremely low costs. And so um, this is something that we can contribute to Ice Cube Gen 2 and for which I hope uh, there is, uh, so far everyone has been very supportive of this, this idea of exploring our participation in Ice Cube Gen 2 uh, using hardware contributions. But also if any of you connected here are associated with the radio astronomy efforts at NCRA or uh, in general radio astronomy and detectors, dipole antennas, et cetera, the future proposed ice cube array wants to also the ice cube surface array wants to also probe uh, in ice interactions at extremely high energies using what is called the Ascarian effect using radio uh, uh, radio detectors. And so, if we if if you know anything about uh, radio detectors, which I know very little about, uh, but you want to be part of this effort, uh, you're welcome to contact me. There are lots of things we can do, um, and uh, so this is something I'm quite excited about. So yeah, this is, uh, I think this is all I have to say. Uh, instead of just the one type of digital optical module that we have within Ice Cube, we are currently exploring many different types of optical modules for the NIS array. Uh, these are also areas where we can uh, contribute in hardware terms, but uh, much of the tasks for these are already taken up by other groups, but uh, as as you know, uh, Ice Cube Gen Two uh, will begin deployment. The the principal array will begin deployment in 2028, and hopefully will be done by 2033. So we have quite a bit of time to find uh, uh, where we will fit in within this collaboration. 
as it is being built. So this is all I have to say. Uh, thank you. Um, Thanks, Ramiz. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we have a few questions. So uh, let's start with Nishita. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, so, Ramiz, I was wondering about your slide number uh, 31. Let me go back to that. Yeah. Mm. Sorry. I, now it's just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I was just uh, wondering about this upturn thing. Uh, is it con consistent with uh, what you see from AMS, for example, or is it something uh, completely different? Upturn and what? In the blue lines? Yes, yes. So this is an upper limit, and this shape is really just determined by our bin-by-bin -bin sensitivity. And it is, it is an upper limit means that we haven't seen anything from these okay. sources. I see. And this is in neutrinos, uh, AMS sees protons. Yeah, I know. I was just protons. wondering whether there was, yeah, but you, like you said, it's an upper limit. So yeah, there is no observation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, just to be clearer on this analysis, this is, uh, we looked at the thousand brightest blazars, which are blazars are these things called active galactic nuclei in which the jet is pointing towards us. And we looked at the thousand brightest of these we see in the sky as seen by Fermi. And we looked for neutrino excesses there, but we found no excess. And so then all we have is this upper limit. But what you can see is that this upper limit is at the level of below our measured flux, which mm -hmm. then allows us to make statements like uh, they can contribute only up to 27% of the flux, etc. And so we published this paper. Uh, three, two years later, we found... Uh, our, uh, you know, one year later, we published that uh, our our first source is a blazer. And uh, so then everyone was like, maybe we should have been a lot more careful in uh, how we worded the earlier paper because uh, people don't take this paper any very seriously anymore. But uh, this is something that I would uh, suggest uh, if, you're, if you're interested in the phenomenology, um, you can collaborate with us. You can get involved in individual papers of Ice Cube and look at everything. Mm -hmm. to understand why if we look at the brightest blazers in the sky, we don't see anything. But then one blazer very far away happened to um, happen to be the first source we discovered. Uh, it could also just be like, you know, statistical. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing to look into that uh, uh, I've been thinking of looking into. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Amul had a question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is um, about the Glashow resonance event. Yes. And I wanted to understand sort of physically uh, how to uh, get rid of your backgrounds of charge current. So one thing I understood is, of course, this does look like a hadronic shower plus um, plus an extra muon, you know, a low energy muon going on. Yeah. Now I would imagine that with uh, charge current events, if the, this event, for example, had uh, um, let me see. Uh, if it had produced um, a tau lepton, the tau could also decay into a low energy muon, like the one that you have. Yes. Perhaps would have given similar hadron kind of stuff. Yes. Uh, it's also possible that um, it could have been a, a, a muon event, which also can produce some hadronic shower, right? And exactly. And so we can't really reject all of those to very high confidence, which is why you have this charge current here at uh, at about, uh, you know, at this level. And you can say this is glass of resonance only at the 100 is to 1 uh, confidence. But that also, you have to realize this is purely due to the relative height of that bright wigner with respect to, you know, the charge current cross-section and the cross-section. Hmm. So I don't... Uh, I, I don't have a figure of that. Maybe I should have put it in there. If the standard model predicted that the Glashow resonance cross-section was 100 times larger than it is in the standard model, this would be now uh, 10,000 is to 1. Yeah, good. so that that basically answers uh, what, what my question was leading towards. So the fact that we know there's a Glashow resonance actually affects the odds that uh, we have. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. So 
the, these these two things are the, this number is fully determined by the flux of astrophysical neutrinos we we know which we measure from all the channels i mentioned to you to you till now and the standard model predictions for the cross sections of these events hmm. yeah. thanks and uh, so uh, now uh, that we have hints of left of yeah, flavor you know universality violation etc these these uh, quantifications need to be continuously re revisited and and refined i guess So, uh, Tuhin, uh, I had postponed some of your questions. So, if yeah, am, am I allowed to ask questions now? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, so maybe I'm. Uh, it, it's it's a very uh, what I'm asking is extremely naive questions. Um, the the um, uh, what you see here is the neutrinos is the in states. Let's say well defined states, and what you are seeing at the end of the day. is uh, you know some hadrons right yes. that is your well defined final state yes all right uh, in between it's quantum mechanical yes okay so whether w is produced on shell or off shell it's only gets to determine on the total momentum of the final state p square you know that's the on shellness of the total momentum final state whether it is equal to mw square or not I agree with you. Are you uh, yes? Right. Yes. Okay. So um, if so, I am allowed. I'm you know whether the the uh, whether the what I'm trying to say is that whether your W was slightly different, let's say five GV different from ninety eighty uh, GV or not, right? That is only going to be measured if the final state P square equals to. I mean, you know that from that thing, right? So what exactly in your mind is the um, is the so called when you say on shell w production because you are you are actually not measure, measuring the p square equal to mw square no that, that you are not checking uh, right? for momentum square right i mean the... yeah but i i, I don't know uh, you know um do those things actually happen that's how we write down the math right no of, of course it happens so the in in lep for example no i mean you actually see the the full bright wigner you reconstruct the bright wigner and you see that only for few of those cases it actually falls like a p square equal to mz square for the rest of them is it's a slope on the left hand side and the right hand side right yeah. that's the bright wigner that you see now question is that i mean uh, when we when you advertised that it's an on shell production i mean is it because the what we see in the final state is the number of hadrons and the number of events we are observing in the final state uh, this number of events is consistent with the production of w close to the resonance are the, yes. is that the definition of uh, events with on shell w production y yes so uh, uh, yes uh, like i said we saw an event that is at 2.3 sigma uh, consistent with the with the existence of the glashow resonance and with that event being uh, being a glashow resonance event um your statement about us advertising it as seeing a glass of resonance this is just a question of community uh, astroparticle physicists don't have a beam so we don't have the luxuries of uh, phi sigma and very careful systematic tests that uh, people do at the lhc or at lep uh, and uh, so you know there is there is more publicity to what you would consider but the paper is carefully written okay it's hmm. not uh, yeah. it's not overselling no, the no no no, no I'm, i'm not i'm not complaining but i was just clearly trying to understand so in 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 the view point is that well you you actually see production cross section of the number of hadrons uh, and it is consistent with that enhancement due to w yeah we see okay. one event at an energy which is consistent uh, with being a w and with uh, with that enhancement due to w so it's it doesn't have to be on shell it's just you know it, it, it at that energy or close to that you see an enhancement and there you expect right. to see one or more right. okay yeah this yeah. yeah it's not perfectly on shell uh, i mean that's also probabilistically that's like measure zero right I, yeah, I yeah, yeah yeah exactly exactly this yes sorry just a comment yeah. this paraf also has some background right when the three events around um, uh, 1 to 1.2 uh, uh, p were found 
uh, people also had worried about whether they could be coming from a tail of a glass shower resonance. And I think there were uh, estimations done and it was shown that uh, the probability of there being glass shower resonance is, was very, very small. I see. Okay. So, so this is uh, looking for glass shower resonance sort of has been in the uh, laundry list of ice cube for some time. Hmm. Hmm. Once they saw the PE, we need to know. Hmm. Okay. Well, we in a say this is a this is sort of a uh, validation of a detector itself, rather than you know uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't see the glass shower resonance, then either say there's something wrong with your uh, with your shower of uh, neutrino, or there's something wrong with the detector. Right? Because or there no are, W exists, or there is a cutoff in the neutrino spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. That, that there is something wrong with the with the neutrino spectrum. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yes, I don't know how to make the standard model work yeah, without yeah. the glass shower resonance. So I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, if we didn't see it, it would mean something else is going on. No, but in, in principle, if you uh, if you end up finding uh, uh, maybe you know, 20 events around uh, around 6 PV, uh, you might be able to reconstruct you know, some kind of a shape that looks like. Yeah. But um, we saw one event in 10 years of... Uh, 10 years of operation. So yeah, yeah. You will do that. Uh, 20 events is, uh, well, okay. The, uh, this is actually in four and a half years of data, but we unblinded, it's not published yet. We have unblinded nine years of data and we haven't seen an additional event. So it's a slight mm -hmm. uh, under fluctuation on the glass of present. But, uh, but Gen2 multiplies the volume by a factor of uh, 10. Something, no? 10, yeah. So eight, well, 8 to 10. 10 is the wish list, but 8 is maybe what is more realistic. So, uh, so if we see, you know, if you want 20 such events with ice cube, uh, we will need uh, 100 years, which, uh, uh, or uh, is years, with Gen is 10 years with Gen 2, no? Yes. So, I'm just saying, not, not, not very pessimistic. Any other questions? So if not, then just thank the speaker once again. Uh, thanks, Ramesh. That's nice talk. Thank you.